All right, what's good to whoever's here early? I forgot to leave the, I forgot to put the countdown clock up, so whatever. I'm just here. Oh, no. Music stuff's off. Give me a segundo. All right, all right, all right, all right. Jordan McCarthy, hello. Saman Kusher, how do you always get here so fast? Lo, Eroboria. What up, what up, what up? What is up? I'm just here right away because I forgot to <laughs> I forgot to click on the countdown scene. Let me pop out. I gotta do my little housekeeping here. I gotta pop out my chat. Uh, I didn't make a thumb. I usually make a thumbnail while I'm sitting on the timer. You know what? The thumbnail that's up is fine. I mean, that's still the drawing I'm doing. It's just behind. We could just use the same one as yesterday. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What are we going to listen to? What are we going to listen to? And it, what, what audio filters do I have? This is all the stuff I usually do while the timer's running. Uh, yeah, let's just do just the volume and we'll put on the other stuff if we need the other stuff. What's up? JD Maitland, Etienne Rinfret, Renola Dominguez, Jeff E. What's up, everybody? I don't know how long I'll wind up going today. I did my day backwards today. I, um, I was going to start with drawing and streaming. And then I had some stuff come up. Wound up spending most of the day doing uh, research on some AI stuff. I'm giving the keynote at a, a summit for this organization called Arite. That, that's, it's not, it's A-R-A-I-T. Um, the Concept Art Association and some other groups like the Society of Illustrators came together and did it. They asked me to give the keynote to launch their summit next Friday. So I wound up going down the rabbit hole doing some research today. Now here I am, drawn late. So I'm just gonna be around for a bit, but I still wanted to stream. I should put the link for that, right? The summit is free to attend. It's live. It's done over Zoom. Um, so another thing I totally would have done during the timer. Um, dur, dur, dur. I'm gonna put the link to the website to sign up for the summit in the description if anybody's interested in that. All right, it's in there. If anyone wants to go to that, the link is the third link in the description. It says AI ML Advocacy Summit. You go there, you can see the schedule, a bunch of the speakers that they got. It's got the info on there and you just sign up. It's free. You just need a Zoom access and then you follow the schedule that's on the website and you can go to bunch of different talks. There's a, you, there's different panels for different geographic regions. Um, some general talks at the beginning, like an open informational session. And then it ends with sort of like everybody coming back together and they workshop like uh, some proposals for um, like ethics proposals and things like that. And I think somebody later on then goes and sort of collates all of the ideas into a cohesive proposal. Mic sounds a little weird. I'm guessing that's just raw echo from my room. I just moved, I don't have enough sound canceling stuff in here. It's probably just echo. Unless I have my filters on wrong. 
No, I don't think so. I just got gay now. Is it free? Yes, it is. The event is free. No, I don't want this music. I want other things. I want that. Hey, oh, Felipe. Hello, Sapo. Hold on, it's a little hot here. Goodbye, Nick. Have a good rest. Yeah, this is later than usual. And I'll only be on for a, a bit, probably. But I said I would stream today, so God damn it, here I am. Goodbye, Lasse. Thank you. May you rest. May you sleep. May you slip into the sweet darkness of sleep. I'm just warming up the hand a bit before I go back and uh, keep working on that guy. Your work of detail is amazing. Thank you, Mama Nova. Mama Nova. I appreciate it. And everybody just chill. Everybody get to sketchbooking. Dude, if you're not sketchbooking along to this, it's like, what's wrong with you? Pop, pop. I know that was loud. Hi, Steven. New fan here. Your inspirational art talks have been really nice to create to. Or though I must say I'm lucky I haven't expressly needed them yet. But if I will, I now know of them. I misspelled your first name, sorry. No problem. Love, Bystrom. I'm pretty forgiving of people hitting me with the PH. It's very fine. I tend not to get bent out of shape about it. I'm glad you like the videos, indeed. If you ever need them, they're there. Usually when I meet another Steven, at a party though, the first thing I say to them is, um, are you a V or a PH? And then we sort of joust on that a little bit. It's a fun way to break the ice with other Stevens, who are the only people I uh, talk to, by the way. If I meet anybody else, a uh, Jennifer, a Matt, a Dylan, a Irene, anything like that, any, anybody else, 
any other kind of name, I already know everything I need to know about that person. I don't talk to him. I refuse to talk to him. I won't talk to him. The, I, I'm only friends with Stevens. I'm only friends with Stevens. Everybody in my family who I talk to, their name is Steven. My wife is named Steven. They're the only people I talk to. I don't want to talk to anybody else. I'm just not interested. It's because I have personal experience as a Steven. I know what we're about. I know we're trustworthy. Anybody else is like, how can you know? Hey Steven, did you finish that other drawing? No, it's there. I gotta work on it more. It ain't done. Oh, it ain't done. Hi Doe, what's up? Steven, can you speak Portuguese? No. Not at all. Your dog Fanny is called Steven too? Yep, you bet. The Steven verse, it's nothing, it's Steven's all the way down. It is Steven's all the way down. Did you meet anyone named Lama or Lamar? Never. Not once. Not ever, 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 ever. Never. I did know an Omar before I excised everybody in my life whose name wasn't Steven. He was a good dude. He's one of the few people that I'm like, it was a shame to lose him in the Steven purge, but we did have to lose him. Interesting. When I talk to other Samans, I ask bird or dry grass or resources because Saman means different things in Turkish, Arabic, and Kurdish. That's cool. Now that's cool. That's the kind of stuff I like. Other stuff I don't like. That I like. That I like a lot. Now we're feeling it. What do you do with old sketchbooks? Dog. I tear them up. It's teeny tiny pieces. I make billions of little scraps of paper out of them. Each one of these sheets, I can get hundreds of little pieces of paper out of it and I sell the little pieces of paper for serious money. For serious money I sell them. Every little, you know, we're talking about like a piece might be like this big. One that you would buy from me on the street. Let me zoom in on that. Let me give you a look at that. You see that? You see that right there? That's not even close enough for some of you. Some of you piece scrap perverts. I'll show you. I'm scanning over there. Look at that. That's doing it for you, right? That's what you want. That's what you like. That's what freaks like you like. One of these right here, it's like I'm under a microscope right now. One of these right here, baby? One of these right here on the streets, dude? It's always uncool to say the price, so I'm just gonna say what I sell this for. Right here, right next to it. Oh, you thought I was done? No comma right there. Oh, you still think I'm done? No, keeps going. It's serious money, folks. It's serious money. A lot of times. That's why I don't work for clients anymore, man. It's just like, they can't cover that, son. They can't cover that, dog. But you know, you could do that when you got the best product around. That's the only time. drawing what is this thing why is its head down here I 
I don't know about this centipede thing, man. I don't know about this centipede thing. Pretty close to just going podcast mode and reviewing art station for the next hour, I'll tell you what. Pretty close. Jamie Odd says, what do you do with all the drawings you complete? Do you archive them, sell them, or burn them to keep yourself from getting attached to material items? I keep them. I've got them in like portfolios in the back of the studio. Um, sometimes I'll give one to a friend if uh, I think they'll actually hang it. <laughs> My drawings are eminently unhangable. <laughs> um... And then like every and then like every five years or so, I'll give everything that I have to like my mom and she'll put it in the archives in her basement. Cause you build up you build up a lot. Like I think like under my bed in the bedroom right now, I think I've got in a big plastic bin, I think I've got like at least there's gotta be like 25 to 30 like full sketchbooks just stuck under there in this big plastic bin. It's just like, they take up so much space. Yo, how much did I miss? Not much, I haven't been on for long. God's Gladiator says your art looks great, thank you. Doe says, Steven, how did you study composition? Really curious about what was your learning experience? Any advice on studying it? Thank you. Um, I've definitely expressed this feeling before. Um, if you've been around, you've probably heard me say this before, but like, I, I don't think, I don't think composition is something that is like studied, um, in the traditional way that people talk about it to a very specific application. You can study certain principles of composition. So like, let's say within comics, there's gonna be some things that work for comics over and over and over again. And those can be downloaded or for storyboards or for working within a filmic format like 16.9 or something like that. There's a few things that can be said about any individual specific niche application um, of composition that you can learn. But I think in general, composition is well, people sometimes call it a fundamental, and I actually don't agree that it's a fundamental. I think the principles and the elements of art are fundamentals, but I think that composition is sort of what you do with everything. It is the job. So it's not really a, a task. Does that sound weird? Like, it's what you're doing every time you draw. Like, you are composing. So it's too meta, I think, to say, like, how do you study it separately? Um, and even if I try to make it more practical, so like for me, you asked how have I studied composition? My study of composition is based entirely on the problems I want to solve and my preferences and my influences. So I don't look at the, like, I don't, well, I was going to say, I don't look at the composition in film, but I, I do look at the composition in film a lot. And, uh. Uh, I do like sort of teaching in that regard sometimes, but for my personal work, film doesn't really influence me. Like for commercial work, it does a lot, but for this stuff, um, film is not really an influence on the composition. Modern compositional tropes and motifs are not really an aspect of it. Um, for my personal work, I compose more like the antiques and, or antique, more like the work that was done in antiquity, um, referencing classicism, referencing, you know, sculptures like friezes and things like that. Dramatic tableaus, uh, less depth, more flattening, things like that. Um, all of those things in another context would be considered compositional failures. You get what I'm saying, right? Like if you were, if you were following the uh, common composition advice given within like the illustration world these days, um, you're gonna get asked to do a lot of depth and every you get this impression that like everything should have dynamic perspective or something like that. Um, so 
me framing things off of flattened things, like freezes, for example, would be considered a failure. Um, but it solves my particular problems and it relates to the themes that I like to work with. So for me, it's not a failure. For me, it's a success. So that's an example of like how there is no blanket thing you could say about composition. It's about your goals and what specifically you're trying to use your compositions for, what you want to communicate with them. So in that sense, a study of composition would become a dive into art history and a dive into the psychology of how shapes and pictures and lines affect people. And really like, it really quickly gets tied up with, you know, just highfalutin pretentious stuff about like, what do you think depth means philosophically? Like, <laughs> re and really, I mean it, really, that stuff is, on the high level, that's what artists are thinking about. But um, that's probably not the answer anybody wants to hear, right? That's the real deal. What are you drawing, Sensei? I, I refuse to explain any of my drawings, I refuse. I usually have no idea, not until I'm done. I'm finding out what I'm drawing at the same time you're finding out. God, I'm a jerk. I'm just, I'm not a cool guy. That sounds so uncool. It's the truth. What I'm saying is the truth, but it sounds so uncool. <laughs> I sound like a total jerk. I don't know what to tell you. That's just really the case. Sam Lamb sees, sees Mel and I see Sam Lamb. How did you know I was just looking for something to draw along to? They told me. YouTube told me, YouTube sent me a letter. They were like, Kalk Klawak is looking for something to draw to you, better get on. And I was like, but I'm tired, YouTube. And they were like, look, this is your only shot. You gotta get in. You gotta get in. Joe says, very enlightening. Thank you so much again. My pleasure, truly. Jeff says, I love the truth, but I'm a jerk too. So, hey, we're all, we're all a little bit jerks. Kalk Klawak. Isn't composition generally about intentionally guiding the viewer's eye around the drawing? Yes, but it's many other things. And the question is, when you do that eye movement, like what are you trying to achieve, you know? The, the preponderance of ways that you could move the eye very quickly starts to ask you a lot of those more wide-ranging questions that I mentioned. All right, let's go over to our bigger drawing. Sam says, hello, Steven. I see you with my eyes. I feel seen. I do feel seen. Closer to me this way. Yup. Yup. Yep. Hey, you. What's up? Oh, I forgot to take a photo for this hand. I had said I was going to do that, and then I forgot.
Ayub says house tour when? House tour? Why do you want a house tour? You ain't gonna get a house tour until I'm stunting on everybody. Even then, you won't, you won't get a house tour. Even then. Why do you want to see my house? I live in a normal ass place. <laughs> a very underwhelming home. I'm gonna be like, here's my, here's my dish rack. This is where I leave the dishes to dry. I don't even have a nice studio, you know? I wanna get there. This might be the first studio I try to deck out, but uh, I've never had a nice studio space. My studio spaces have always been pretty Spartan. All these other artists who like really trick out their studio space and it's like uh, nice lighting and all these little you know, just a little, it was like a, it was like a, like a plant, you know, like they got like a, a plant somewhere. It's like, it's on the desk or something, you know, all the, all the, I don't understand that. I can't, I've, I've never had that. I don't do that. For all my years, my favorite desk, uh, my favorite desk to work on is a big six foot catering table. Just a $50, six foot wide, fake ass laminate, just MDF laminate with these metal, just tube legs, just six foot catering table. That's what I've been working on for years. That's what I do all my work on. <laughs> Evening stream, it's true, it's true. Jag says, you really love to draw naked men, huh? Rolling on the floor laughing. What's funny, Jag? What's funny, baby? Lloyd says, show me the coffee machine. Actually, my coffee machine's pretty nice. It's one of those like carafe ones where it doesn't get too hot. You know, there's no burner on the bottom to keep it hot. It's got the insulated carafe instead. It's like, just the right, just warm enough, the thing. Just warm enough, the thing makes it the perfect temperature. But it doesn't matter because I buy crap coffee. I have this nice coffee maker, but I buy garbage coffee. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter at all. Sandra says, I want to move to New York City, but forgot that there are no dishwasher dishwashers. And I don't know if I'm up for that. I have a dishwasher. You can find an apartment with a dishwasher. But New York's, New York's not for everybody, dude. There's bigger problems with New York than there not being dishwashers. I'm starting, finally, after all these years, I'm starting to get a little tired of it. <laughs> I really am. I'm starting to get a little tired of it. I'm losing my edge. I'm losing my edge, you know? It used to be like, you know, I used to get recharged for New York by having aggressive confrontations with strangers on the street. And now that doesn't energize me the way that it used to. Yeah, I'm a little tired of it. Maybe do a stream where you try to draw your house from memory. Oh, that'd be good. That is a favorite drawing exercise of mine. I haven't done that with uh, any new stuff. They'd, it'd be too easy right now. There's not enough stuff in the apartment. Gotta buy more stuff. 
Sam Land says, Stephen, do I have a question? I'm interested in work on my next piece that will have a scratch boardy wood cutty and gravy. Nice. Franklin Booth, DeRay, Dura Look. I'm pretty sure that all I, all I need to do here is to study these artists' mark making and then apply that to the rest of the process I'm developing. Thumbnail sketches, maybe use of 3D for mock-ups. Can you think of any insight that is unique bespoke to that style of drawing that I should look into? Um, you're absolutely right. Like it, that is the main thing that you need to do, but something that I found with those particular um, artists, like especially Durer, well, he was doing a lot of engravings too, but I think especially for Franklin Booth, Booth and Doré, um, they, they planned the individual areas meticulously from what I can tell. Um, like an engraving is just, it's serious business. Like it takes long enough and you go slow enough that you really can plan every single spot. So um, when you're doing the, when you're doing the, like you should go through a stage in the ink preparations where you literally plan key area, areas, like down to the hatch, like rehearse them before going down on the actual final piece of paper. Um, Cause they got quite tricky and quite technical with it. So maybe you already knew this, maybe this was already assumed in the things that you said, but um, in case it wasn't, yeah, like feel free to go like really granular on planning the hatches and the black and white layout of individual key areas because they certainly did. It's like, you know, they were, they were moving individual hatches, moving groups of hatches, finding particular waves to turn forms using the, the hatches that they had. So definitely do that. Definitely be open to that. How did you learn this level of anatomy? Well, I studied anatomy for a long time. I mean, this, you know, this drawing is purposefully breaking the anatomy and doing all sorts of weird stuff to it. But um, yeah, there's no way around it, but uh, hard work. And I mean, years and years and years of work and really just wanting it, you know, it was really important for me to have good anatomy when I was coming up. It was like my favorite aspect of art, so I really just put a lot of time into it. I read like, um, God, it, it was such an important part of my life, <laughs> such an important part of my journey. Um, even though I don't really, nowadays, it's long enough behind me now that I don't really think about it too much, but yeah, I took like, um, I read like all the anatomy books, like all the big anatomy books. And I mean, I read them. Like I read them like books. I didn't use them as, I didn't use them as reference books. Even like Elliot Goldfinger's uh, Anatomy for Artists. I, I think I have the name wrong, but people know it. The famous one by Elliot Goldfinger, which is written as a, a reference book. It's like, you're supposed to, he says so. He's like, you're supposed to have a model in front of you. You're confused about an area. You go to that page and you read the muscle that's there and it, it breaks it down. I read it cover to cover, start to finish as if it was a chronological book. I just went through and read every individual muscle page so that I just knew that somewhere at some point I had absorbed all the info about a particular muscle and the skeleton and everything like that. I used to do that on the New York City subway um, going to and from my girlfriend's uh, apartment. Um, I spent a very long time doing that. And with every other book, you know, I did it with all the famous ones. I did it with Bridgman, um, Stephen Rogers Peck, uh, Vanderpool's Guide to Human Figure, which is very good for general massing of forms, but people just look at the plates on that. I don't remember if I read the whole thing through, but I read a huge part of it. I read a huge part of it, and that's old-timey text, you know? Um, Drawing Lessons from the Great Masters by Robert Beverly Hale, Anatomy Lessons from the Great Masters by Robert Beverly Hale, which is not an, uh, as good of a book as um, Drawing Lessons from the Great Masters, but... Um, and I took classes. I took classes with Ray Bustos when I was in college. Um, so getting one-on-one -on -one training with anatomy and going to cadaver labs and looking at the actual desiccated muscles on a preserved human body and all that, like, just spent a long time doing that. Really long time. Doing an anatomy tracings, doing tons of figure drawing, not just doing uh, 
sort of flayed anatomy drawing, but going to figure drawing all the time. Yeah, there, there's not like one thing I could say about how I got to, to do anatomy the way I do it now. And it's all, it was, it was all easy just because I love it. I just find it interesting. It's super interesting stuff. I mean, this is your flesh cage. This is your meat prison. Isn't it cool to kind of like know how it's put together and why it looks the way that it looks? What underlying conditioning phenomena are producing every little bump and swaggle? It's fun. That's fun. Hey, Nick. Nick says, what's up, Stephen? Cool drawing. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. I'm glad you think it's cool. Can't stay too long. Got to go to a life drawing session. That's what's up. See? You get it. What type of paper is your go-to for drawings? I'd like to up my paper knowledge for drawings. Do you have any suggestions of papers to try? This is the one I always recommend, the one I'm working on now. Strathmore 400 series paper, uh, bristle paper, smooth, smooth surface. Use it all the time. I highly recommend to everybody, just use good paper for most of everything. People who take my course, they see me saying it in there all the time, like um, the course begins doing spheres and cubes and things like that. And uh, when people post their assignments and it's like clearly in like a, a cheaper sketchbook, it's always in there when I give the crit. I'm always like, you got to do it on good paper. It's like if you're, even for something as basic as rendering a sphere, if you're really trying to do it as best you can, if you're trying to go all the way and you're really trying to investigate how to render form, um, it doesn't make sense to do it on cheap paper because that's cutting off the top 10% of level of execution that you could be rehearsing and you're not getting exposure to that and you're not figuring out how to make that work. You always want to, you want, want to use really good paper, even for basic exercises, if you're going to push them all the way so that you can actually rehearse the full possible spectrum of execution. Average says, I work at Starbucks and I draw on the oven paper when I have a moment, LOL. <laughs> You're deranged, Average. That's deranged. That's a horrible thing to do. Only bad people would do that. You're a bad person. You really revealed your truth there. We see your true colors now. You can't hide from us. You can't hide from us. Is that better than the 150 or 100? Um, yeah, the 400 series is the... Uh, is the best except for the 500 series, which I don't think they have bristle paper smooth in 500. I think Strathmore in the 500 series, they only have plate. They have vellum and plate. And plate is smoother than smooth. And I've tried it and I don't, I don't like it. It's too smooth for me. It's been a long time since I tried it though. Maybe it's changed. No one has plate. and You never see it anywhere. They don't have it at any of the stores, the plate. It's very rare to see it. Mr. Grinch said, right, 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 what does 400 series mean? Yeah, the, the lower the numbers, the lower quality, and then it goes up to 500, 500 being the best. For Strathmore, they're the only ones who do it that way. Rich from a guy who uses cheap coffee? Don't, don't, don't 
Don't come in here and judge me like that, all right? Don't come in here and judge me like that. For me, coffee isn't about the potency of single sips. It's about the experience of drinking watered down, weak coffee over a very long period of time. It's just that. It's that comforting feeling. It's like 1% of being in a diner with a friend. And that's all I want. I just want that emotional recall. I don't wanna be having this couture experience with like blue giant coffee or something like that. What does quality paper offer that regular paper doesn't? The big difference is that regular paper for the most part cannot suffer abuse. It breaks under abuse, which is always in the back of your head and makes you less inclined to correct things, less inclined to fix things, less inclined to erase things. High quality paper, you can even really dark areas like this under here in the, uh, in the secret spot. And right, and right there where people keep their secrets. Even a really dark area like that, like the secret spot, um, if, if you were racing there pretty hard, you could get it back, not all the way to white from that near black, but very close to it, like 10 or 20% gray. And then you can keep drawing over it. It won't destroy the paper. Uh, normal, cheaper, standard paper, even if you can erase it, it's always different there. The, erase, the paper pills or it starts to streak or it doesn't take the graphite up to the same level. Really heavy paper is thick. It's the same paper from surface through to the middle. So you can be really aggressive with it. You can even scrape highlights in with a knife if you want. And there's more paper underneath and it'll continue to allow you to draw over it. Dude, did I feed my dog dinner? I did. I did feed my dog dinner. Patrick Kirby says you could have pointed at the armpit instead. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. You're a pervert. You're a pervert, Patrick. And now everybody knows it. Everybody knows you're obsessed with armpits now. Damn shame. Damn shame. You know, you hate to see it. An artist right at the outset of their career just having everybody find out their intimate, intimate feelings about armpits. It's rough. It's not easy. You know, my heart goes out to you. I hate, hate to hear stories like that. I hate to hear stories like that, but it does happen. Hey, Javon, what's up? Deanna says, secrets out. Should have kept it in the secret spot. If only, if only. Awa says, Steven Zapata is my favorite anime girl. Yikes. I'd make a good one though. I'd make a good one. I'd have a loyal following for sure. I'd be on a few pillows and there'd be dudes making YouTube videos about how I'm, you know, I'm actually deeper than I seem and 
You know, if you stick with the anime through some of the tropes that are a little eye rolly, everybody agrees that I'm actually deeper and more interesting as a character than you might believe just from my outward appearance. <laughs> Mama Nova says, I love drawing. Me too. I think there's probably a lot of people in here who do. Steven, are you a fan of Gox on YouTube? He spends like 100 hours producing his drawing videos. Very impressive. I am not familiar with him, but I got to check him out. Watching you with your detail is very helpful. I'm glad. If there's anything people take from the detail stuff from my streams, I hope it's that uh, I'm not rushing. I hope people can see that. That it takes me forever and that that's okay. And I go even slower when I'm off stream. I like can't really help going a little faster on stream just cause I know people are watching. And even though I know the amount that I'm speeding up is like, it contributes and takes away nothing from stream. Like I know it's inconsequential. I've noticed that no matter what I do, I just can't help it. I still go slightly faster just because I know people are watching. Um, but I'm always, outside of that context, I'm always trying to slow down more rather than rush. I'm always trying to go slower and slower. Drawing is the one thing I can unabashedly be a shill for, says Yarksna. Yeah. Oh yeah.
Albie says, do you play games? Yeah. Not that much. I'm, I'm, I'm the type to, uh, I'm the type to play when something big comes out. Not like, not like big, like it's played by everybody, but like when, um, it can be like an indie game or something like that, but just something that everybody's like, whoa, this is some, this is some serious stuff. You can't miss this. Those darlings, I always try to, I try to play those. But then once I'm kind of done with that, I don't really have the habit of like just playing games all the time anymore. I certainly used to back when I was a kid. But now once, um, once I don't have something like that on my plate, I just kind of, it's fine. I just stopped playing games for long periods of time. Maybe months until something else comes out. I mostly only play uh, single player stuff. Never really got into like having like a standby like multiplayer game that I play. Missed that. I missed every part of those big moves, even though I've been, you know, cross paths with a lot of a lot of video game history over my years, my many years. Uh, I skipped all of the big parts that were like multiplayer. Like I never got into MMOs or anything like that. A lot of my friends did, so I sort of, I sort of caught it by proximity, but even when I was a kid, I just could never get into them. Are you into reading manga like Berserk or Vagabond, Amazing Art? Not really, not really into manga, not really into anime. I've read a bunch of them. Um, like I've read parts of Berserk. I've looked at the art from many of them, you know, to familiarize myself with the art, if the art's really cool, but um, not a big comic reader. I don't know why that is. It's just not my format, I don't think. I wonder why that is. I'll be honest, I think I've, I've, maybe I've seen like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of why I always bounce off of comics, almost always. I think when I'm reading something, it's like, I just wanna read the words, even though I love art. Usually when I'm read when I'm trying to read a manga or a comic or something like that, I start getting this is gonna sound like I don't love art, but like I start getting frustrated that the pictures are in the way. I'm I'm like my brain hyper focuses on the text. I just wanna like read the text. Um so I always wind up bouncing off. Maybe I'm misdiagnosing that for myself. I don't know what it is. It's just not my format. I like reading though. Just reading books with only words on the page, for the love of God. The Last of Us loved the game and the show. The show's good, I'm watching it now. I'm impressed by it. They did a really good job with the source material. I didn't play Last of Us, but I did sit on the couch next to Ahmed al Duri the whole time while he played it. That was a couch game for us. I 
I think at the time it came out, it was a PS3 game originally, right? Am I remembering that right? I didn't have a PS3. I skipped that console generation. I was like college and I was like really up my own ass and I was like, I can't have video games in the house or else I won't work. Which was like, I should have seen that wasn't true because my roommate had video games in the house and I didn't play them. So clearly I was able to control myself. Maybe because you old now? Yeah, maybe because I'm old now. But I could never read comics. Even when I was a kid, never got into like anything, Marvel, DC, anything like that. Um, I bought a few comics, you know, I remember buying them from comic book stores and I would just sort of skim for the art. And never, never read them, never got into the storylines, anything like that. The only comics I've read Like full comics that I've read are, um, well, let me think about this. Is this true? Yeah, I think it's true. The only comics I've read are Watchmen and V for Vendetta, I think. I have a bunch of old comics. I have, um, again, I've never read them, but I have a bunch of volumes of um, uh, Prince Valiant by Hal Foster. I have some big Prince Valiant books out on the bookshelves. They're like 17 inches tall, really nice reproductions. Um, I have um, Mary Perkins on stage. That was an old like soap opera comic by um, an artist named Leonard Starr. He's actually the guy who uh, developed Thundercats. Um, before he made Thundercats, he did this, uh, yeah, like a soap opera style, like a serialized drama slash adventure comic uh, that ran in the newspapers. But um, I have a bunch of collections of that just because he's one of the best people ever with ink, with, with ink lines. So when I found his work uh, right around the time I was trying to get better at inking years and years ago, um, I got really obsessed with his stuff. So I bought these collections so that I could look at tons of examples. So what made you fall in love with drawing and painting? Oh God, I was always, I don't know. I mean, it was just always there. I always had it in my life. I mean, my sister remembers um, showing me, like introducing me to drawing, like drawing a cat for me and showing me how you could like think of it as a series of steps and things like that. But um, after sort of those initial experiences, I'm talking specifically like, those ones with my sister where she was like, look, here's how you draw something. And she's not like a big artist or anything like that. She was just like, she was just drawing like a, a cat that was like a sphere and a triangle and triangles for the ears. Um, I just never got over it. I thought that was the best magic trick ever. And from there on out, I started bringing a sketchbook with me everywhere. And even as a kid, I like really wanted my sketchbook with me. I would get upset. If we left the house without it, I was like, we gotta go back. I need my sketchbook. What if I need to draw something? And it just, uh, it never stopped, you know? I had that relationship very early on and that love very early on. I feel very fortunate for that. Drawing is my, drawing is my oldest friend. That's really how I feel about it. And I do feel like it's like a, a relationship that I have, like I'm in relationship to drawing. <sighs> I get emotional when I think about it a lot of times. It's like, it's so real. I get, I get freaked out every time. It really is just my oldest friend. It's always been there with me. And it has taught me a lot and given me a lot.
What if Thundercats was styled in a telenovela? That'd be disgusting, dude. Because all telenovelas have is like cheating on each other. That's like the plot line of every telenovela. Telenovela. So it'd just be like, I mean, we're, were Lionel and Chitara even together? Like, were they in a relationship? Well, they would be in the telenovela version. And Lionel would just be finding out that like, Chitaro's, Chitaro's sleeping with a, I forget all the characters. Was it Panthro? Who was the other one who looked like Chitara? Oh no, but that's her brother, right? Yeah, none of that. <laughs> It'd be gross, man. It'd be gross. It'd be gross and it's gross that you brought it up. Also, is that furry? You're really showing your true colors here. You gotta be careful. Some vile stuff you're talking about, some vile stuff. Those are lions and cheetahs, man. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. This is dark stuff, dude. It's because of people like you that kids can't hang out here. There's no seven-year-olds that are checking out the Steven Zappet art stream. It's dark, dude. It's dark. People like you are holding me back. <laughs> holding me back, brother. I could be making that Kinder chocolate egg money if it wasn't for people like you. I gotta find a way to get at this. Headpiece. Zach Feldman says, howdy, been drawn the whole time the stream was active but didn't know you were on, ha ha. Ha ha, ha ha, that's great, that's so funny. That notification bell, son. That notification bell, sir. I'm kidding about the sadness there, I don't care. Nah, I don't care. YouTube is what it is. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be problems. Hey, Daryl Grant. You go right along. You get out of here now. Go on, Daryl Grant. Go. Go on, boy. Get out of here. You'll catch it later. What paper type is that? In dimensions, how wide and tall is it? Is it expensive to purchase? It's not all that expensive, this paper. Um, it depends where you are, though. You know, different parts of the world, different import stuff and things like that. This is 18 by 24 inches and it is Strathmore 400 series bristle paper smooth. Which is usually if you go in the description for this stream, if you go to the bottom of the description, I have it written there. Yeah, I don't know how expensive it would be by you. It's pretty affordable paper, I think. I consider good quality paper is usually, um, it's more than a dollar a sheet. I think you should pay more than a dollar a sheet if you're looking for good quality paper. Something thick, not cheap. There's 25 in this, in this pad and these pads are usually like 25 to 30 bucks, which I think is pretty affordable. Watercolor paper is good too. That's usually more expensive.
Mr. Sun says, my country doesn't stock smooth paper, only pain, dark, very dark. I do feel like I'm addicted to drawing. Is that normal? Yeah, yeah. People, people who get into drawing are, they tend to, they're really into it. <laughs> um, there's very few people getting into drawing uh, on a lark. People tend to get into drawing because there's something deep inside of them that's telling them to do it. And it often gets existential very quickly. And then once you're into like people who've been doing it for a while, almost no one's pursuing it for years. No one's pursuing it for years on a lark. Everyone who's doing it for a long time, it's because it got its claws in them. Because drawing ain't easy. And the industry ain't easy. And making money with it isn't easy. And finding time for it in your life isn't easy. So if you're going to do it, it's because you love it, baby. Oh, you love it. Yeah, the voices won't stop unless I put pencil to paper. I hear you. Look, there's a lot of people here in that situation. Uh, I'm going to be bent over for a while, so I'm just going to point this down in my face. I continue to be too lazy to put my green screen up. <laughs> I suck. You know, they say it sucks to suck, but it's not so bad. Sometimes it's all right. Jack Foster says, Steven live at this hour. Yeah, well, I wanted to stream today. I had said I was gonna stream today and uh, my schedule in the earlier part of the day got jacked up, but I still wanted to stream. So I was like, you know what, it's all right to do it late. Come in at an unusual time, but at an unusual time, maybe do a little bit of a stream, maybe it won't be that long, but hey, here I am and here I am and I'm doing a drum. That's what I said to myself. I was like, yeah, it's all right. Ah, sorry. Ah. Ah. No problem, baby. Ah. I caught up doing some research all earlier this day. There's an AI ML ethics advocacy summit put together by Concept Art Association and other groups that have come together. And uh, that's not this Friday, but next Friday. And they asked me to kick it off. They asked me to do the keynote for the summit, give a sort of introductory speech. So I was doing some research on some recent AI stuff and I went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and before I knew it, it was five o'clock. Went down the rabbit hole. Bro, the GoFundMe is dying. We're actually close, dude. Since I was just talking about it. Don't forget, y'all. That the Concept Art Association Artist Protection Fundraiser is out there. If you've had it in your mind, if it's been floating around ambiently, please consider donating. I'm going to put it at the top of the description right now. It's already in there, but I'm going to move it up. For any of you who have been considering donating to that, let me just push you over the edge. Please do it. <gasps> Please. Where is it at? I haven't looked down. Oh, it's so close. Come on. Go on, give those donos, baby. God's Easy Gladiator with the two Lira says, any conspiracy theories you believe in? Uh... Not currently, I don't think. Not any current ones. I did when I was a kid. There's definitely stuff that I'm curious about though. Definitely stuff I, it's the UFOs, man. <laughs> I've just read too much sci-fi in my life. That one I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? It's I wanna believe. It's, it's just that, it's just I wanna believe.
Thank you so much for the donation. God's gladiator. God's gladiator. Yeah, I guess I couldn't say the UFO stuff is a conspiracy theory at this point because I um, I don't think I have any interest in the part of the question that's like, is the government suppressing something about UFOs? I don't know about that. I'm not, that part's not super interesting. I'm just interested in the in the core question. Could they really be UFOs? Could they really be from some other planet? The politics? I'm like, ugh, boring. I'm only interested in the baseline question up front. How's the lawsuit thing going if it's going at all? Um, I mean, they're doing it. I don't know. I know what you know. I, be I believe at this point they would be doing um, like closed door court stuff, like discovery and things like that. I don't think we're going to hear from those lawsuits for a bit. I'm not a legal expert, but I think, you know, they make the announcement and then they go into this period where it's like, it's between the plaintiff and the defendant and the court. And then they have, uh, if they go, if they have a trial, then they go to trial. Uh, I think it's called discovery, right? But I think discovery is not public and they don't release info about it until later. So it might be a while before we hear anything. I think a lot of that stuff is going to go on behind closed doors for a while. How did the Bigfoot get here if there are no UFOs? Word up. Word up. I watched a little uh, indie movie a while ago called Hunting Bigfoot. I'd recommend it. I thought it was good. It was charming. Does anyone remember the show Chespirito or Sabado Gigante? Yeah, I remember Sabado Gigante. My parents used to watch Sabado Gigante. That was just a, that's just an old fashioned variety show, right? <laughs> when I was seeing Sabado Gigante, there was nothing like that on American TV. Or, there must have been, but much, nothing of that stature. There was nothing popular like that, like a straight-up variety show on American TV at that time. Goodbye, Mr. Sun. Androtas says, hi, Stephen, late stream for you. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I usually stream in the, in the mornings. But I had a few curveballs thrown at me this morning. Schedule got messed up. Went down some research rabbit holes. But I still wanted to stream, so here I am. I am getting real tired, though. That's why I stream in the mornings, usually, because... Uh, I have most of my drawing energy, really just most of my energy in general, I have in the morning.
that reminded me, I gotta check in on my wife. Steven, how would one go about finding contacts to send an art portfolio to? Seems a bit difficult to know where to start. Um, well, if you know the, the companies that you'd like to send to or something like that, then uh, you can check their websites and a lot of them have uh, open submission emails on there. You can also try to find their art directors. Like if you go on the website, they'll list their art directors and then you can try to look up the art directors on LinkedIn or something like that. And you can message them through there. Find them on Twitter. If you find them on Twitter, I wouldn't send them like a, a DM like, well, maybe, I don't know. I, I just feel like most people don't answer their DMs. You know, most people's inboxes are pretty flooded these days. Um, but you can find emails on their Twitter and stuff like that or places to reach out to them. But I'd say probably a, a website for a company that has an explicit request for open submissions, uh, that's often a good way to go. Quite a few places are closing that down these days though because they're getting too many AI submissions. That's interesting. Hmm. Art places and writing publications are doing that and they're closing open submissions because they don't want the AI stuff and it's just overwhelming everything. They don't have the resources to sift through it. You are a great artist, Stephen. Good night. Thank you, God's Gladiator. Have a good night. You're very kind. Stephen, what do you think about having days where you don't draw at all? You just research the science of something so much because it's so interesting. Well, that's a great day. What's the problem? There's nothing... There, don't, don't get too hung up on the like uh, boot camp mentality that you have to draw every day or something like that. There's a lot of aspects to the creative endeavor besides drawing. And even if you're not being creative, you, you don't, there's nothing in the rule book says you have to do it every day. There's no need to burn yourself out on stuff like that for no reason, for no damn reason. Any day where you're, a day of research is so fun and life affirming on its own, you know, it's so fun to learn things. So what I'm trying to say is I don't see any problem with that and I resent our culture for making it a question to ask in the first place. I'm trying to study the Artist Master Series color book. Wow, it's challenging. I don't think I'm familiar with that one. I haven't read too many color theory books. Took some color theory classes in college. Um, read James Gurney's Color and Light. Yeah, I think specific color theory books I'm not super familiar with. I got most of my color theory from classes. Didn't read many books on it. Thoughts on cashews, pistachios, walnuts even? Cashews are the most delicious, but walnuts are the most versatile for cooking. That's what I think. Cashews, I'd do a lot for cashews. And I, I would chase cashews across many, many a wasteland. I would pursue them very, very far. Through barren and frightening environments, for sure. I mean, I would case a pack of cashews through a blistering desert for months. I mean, I'd build up a crew, dude. I mean, I would be collecting some desperate, desperate boys, turning them into a ragtag group. Getting real gross out there. 
Real dirty, stinky, no showers, eating horse meat. Just like pursuing that bag of cashews, man. Just kind of like seeing it. It's like 20 miles out ahead of us. It's like I'm getting down on the ground. I'm like trying to sight it on the horizon. I sort of silhouette in the bag of cashews against the, the blue sky. It's like, there it is, boys. About two days ride out ahead of us. We're going to get it. We're gonna get it. I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. Is cashews like crack? Are they that addictive? They're better than crack, dude. The cashew trade, it's wild. It's out of control. I mean, people are out here in the streets, they're murdering each other for cashews. No, cashews do have to have a, a specific power because um, aren't most of the vegans like um, substitute cheeses and stuff like that? Aren't they mostly cashew based? So that must mean cashews have some very special quality if they're like the chosen nut for making even like substitute cheese. Like that's next level stuff. It's like they're that good, but they can also pass for cheese. Like things are out of control. Things are getting out of control. Good day, John. That looks wicked, my man. Thank you. Does anybody like wasabi peas? Oh, my wife, dude. Dude. My wife is bad with wasabi peas. I mean... Oh, my God. She will crush a bag of wasabi peas. It's a spectacle. There's no stopping her. My wife is a fiend for them. You can't buy them. You can't have them in the house. It's like it comes to define the week. It's like it's all about that now. It's all about like thinking about them, resisting them, giving in to them, regretting them. Boiled peanuts are the best. I don't know about boiled. 
Wait, is boiling how they make the uh, the blistered peanuts? Because the blistered peanuts are the best. Those are good. Do they make blistered cashews? Can you blister them the way you can blister peanuts? Chris says, I know you love the great masters such as Raphael and Michelangelo. Is there any source of reference book you could recommend where you can find a lot of the classic works in this? Um, no, I don't know one book that has like a bunch of them. I would just get monographs of some of each individual. Um, I mean, I'm sure a book of that type exists. I'm just not familiar with it. Um, if you're looking for something that shows a lot of classical masterwork, but uh, also analyzes it for drawing, uh, I always recommend Robert Beverly Hale's Drawing Lessons from the Great Masters. That's a great book. One of the best books on drawing. It's a little old timey. The English is uh, old English, not old, old English, but older than we're used to. And um, so it's not gonna be for everybody. It's gonna be annoying to read for a lot of people. And it's not gonna be everybody's cup of tea, but if you can get through the English, um, it's one of the few books that actually discusses draftsmanship decisions. And that's very rare, very, very rare. Very few drawing books teach that stuff. But yeah, it has a lot of, it does it all with classical art. Hey Steven, are you thinking of doing mentorships again anytime soon? Um, I've, dev I've wanted to return to it, but I don't, I keep thinking about it. You know, it's, it's on my mind, but um, I don't know when I'll have the, the time Cause I had a lot of fun doing one-on-one um, -on -one mentorships. And I also had fun doing my group classes and things like that. I think I will probably do classes again first, like the workshops that I used to do. I say used to do, like it was so long ago. It was just, last one I did was at the beginning of last year. So about a year ago, it wasn't that long ago. Um, I was making my course and stuff like that. I think I'll do classes again and um, that'll probably be the first thing that I do. And then we'll have to see about one-on-one -on -one mentorships. I think, I think what I want is like, I wanna like, I want to like bring in the fold of like the, the close group of students. Like I wanna do all the things that I'm currently doing still of course, but I also wanna have like, my tight crew that I'm like, these motherfuckers right here. <laughs> I really believe in these bastards. And um, I, wanna, I wanna help them out as much as I can. I've always wanted that, always wanted that. It's just a hard thing to get going these days. I want to redesign all of this. I see a Steven up there. I'm up here. I'm up here. I'm up here temporarily until I get back to putting my green screen up. My wife's gonna be home any minute now. I'm worried my dog's gonna bark at you guys. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. I've got like, I've got a couple little woofs that she'll do. And that gives me like four seconds to get to the mute button before my dog blows your ears out.
Steven, what do you think about social media like TikTok and the impacts it has to people's mental health? All right, first off, my TikTok is a bastion of culture. It's Rome, it's Greece, it's Italy in the 1400s to 1500s, it's the new Renaissance. My TikTok is, uh, is civilization itself. The rest of TikTok, yeah, I'm concerned about it, of course. <laughs> Of course, I'm, I'm concerned about it. But I, I'm not, not specifically just TikTok. I mean, if, if you go back and listen to some of the old videos on this um, YouTube channel, uh, I've been pretty open with just like... I, I really, I'm very concerned with artists being unaware of how they're being influenced. So I know that you're asking about mental health, which is like an even bigger more real problem but just, even just on the artistic side it's like it's having such a bad effect and this does then go on to ripple to our mental health um it's having such a bad effect that artists are just not they don't even see how so much of their decisions about what kind of artists they're going to be what kind of art they're going to make how they're going to make their art why they're going to make their art it's like all being narrowed down by these gut assumptions about what's going to work on these platforms and things like that. And that I think is super unhealthy, deeply, deeply unhealthy. Um, dark too, dark because I, I think, you know, people's art is really um, very, very close to their being and to their soul. And um, it to narrow that and determine that for them sort of thoughtlessly and just algorithmically is... Um, Dark, very dark, evil, almost. Very, very bad. It scares me. It really scares me a lot. Stephen, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Bridgman books. Do you think they still have value in the internet age? Yeah. Yeah, they're just not, um, you know, like the big Bridgman compendium is called, you know, Bridgman's Complete Guide to Life Drawing or something like that. And it's... It is definitely not a complete guide to life drawing or a complete guide to constructing the figure. They're really, that's really overselling them. They are just excellent at showing the sort of very muscular, very um, blocky geometric way that you can sort of shove the parts of the body together. And that's a, a hugely useful skill that any almost everybody who needs to draw from imagination is going to need. But um, that's what Bridgman's diagrams to me are best for. Uh, as long as you go to him for that, I think, um, you know, if you go and you copy the drawings and you analyze them, it's pretty clear how you can pull that out of them. But um, you're not gonna learn anatomy from the Bridgman books. I mean, there's just way, way better sources for that now. I mean, his anatomy is wrong sometimes. Um, the diagrams are not reproduced nicely, so they're not clear, they're hard to see. Um, and they don't just label things on the drawings. You know, you've gotta like look at the plate over on the side and then look at the text. You get lost in the text. The text is not super clearly written again because it's older. Um, it's just not good for that stuff. It's not good for that stuff. But for the, like, shoving together the big ball of clay in a block and just, uh, like that, those big primary shape things, um, few are better than Bridgman for that. What breed of dog is your pooch? She's some kind of a mutt. She's like, she don't look it, but she's like, um, when we did, we did one of those dog, those bullshit dog DNA tests. And uh, it said she was like a, what was it? A Pomeranian and a Chow Chow mix. She don't look much like a Chow Chow. She looks kind of like a mix between a Pomeranian and a Corgi. That's what she looks like, but I'm not sure that that's what she is. She's a mutt. We saved her from a hoarding house in Mississippi. That's where they got her and we adopted her. Fun fact, her brother, her brother was adopted by famous character actress, Oscar nominated Melissa Leo. Melissa Leo's dog is my dog's brother.
What book do you recommend instead of Bridgman? Uh, depends on for what thing, for what thing specifically. Because just for figure drawing is like, it's it's too big of a topic to just sort of, you couldn't put all the figure drawing in one book, you know? Vague question, but do you think artists deserve more money? Dude, artists deserve all the money. Give me all your money. You shouldn't give money to anybody but me and other artists, but mostly me. Just give it all to me. I'll give it some of it to other artists, don't worry. I'm like a really good like, it's like, you wanna make it easy? Just give all your money to me. I'll make sure it gets distributed well, promise. Head's killing me tonight, folks. I don't know why I have such a bad headache. Honestly, sending my bank login right now. See, Javon knows what's up. Knows what's up. Goodbye, Roach Roach. Good luck on your commission. Pico says, in my experience, a lot of things from Morpho seem to click for people, but they're not as deep into it necessarily. Morpho I'm not familiar with. I saw, I saw for Morpho, or I saw images from Morpho and learned about Morpho sort of after I'd stopped, um, more recently, when I haven't been in the sort of uh, up with the recent releases and figure drawing education, stuff like that. But it looks interesting. I gotta check it out, see what's going on in there. Have you seen Avatar The Way of Water? I have not. I have not. I didn't really, I didn't really get charged up to see it because um, when I saw the first one in theaters with my sister on the Santa Monica Promenade in California, um, years and years and years ago, uh, I gotta admit, I was not a fan of the first Avatar. I did not quite like it when I came out of the theater. So, um, you know, I didn't like it. It's been, God, it's been how long? Over, over a decade? Um, so I didn't really feel much uh, charge to go see it. I've heard it's good. People say it's really good. Ahmed loved it. Ahmed is like, he's ready to get booted in. He's like, give me the Matrix jack plug, just long steel pipe, like right into the cranium, like I'm in, let's go. We're going in, I'm living in the Avatar Waterland forever, man. I don't got a lot of anchors here, going in. I'm living in the Avatar Waterland forever, man. I don't got a lot of anchors here, I don't got a lot of stuff holding me down. I'm ready to go, new life, new life for Med. And I was like, damn, keep your eyes on the road, dude. Keep your eyes on the road, you're scaring me. He was getting real worked up. He was driving. Now, see, I gotta redesign this. These shapes are not flowing the way that I want. I gotta figure something out there. But that also begs me to figure out exactly how far out I want this stuff to go. All right, this is getting pretty serious here, pretty serious. Pretty serious. See, I have some big questions about this because when I was looking at this earlier today, I was thinking about pulling this stuff out way longer. This would be the kind of thing that would be good to do a digital mock-up for. You know what, instead of, instead of ruining it, what I'm gonna do is that when I when I'm done streaming, I'm gonna do what I usually do, which is that after the end of a, 
a session on a longer drawing like this. By longer drawing, I mean any drawing that I come back to over multiple days. Um, when I get up from a session, I'll almost always take a picture of it on my phone. Uh, and that, I don't always do anything with them, don't post them, but uh, if you go through the reel on my phone, there's just like all these little sequential steps for a lot of my drawings. And it's just so that as I go through the rest of my day, um, I can pull it up and look at it if I'm thinking about it or trying to think of how I can solve something, you know, while I'm sitting around or away from home or something like that. But the other good thing is that if I want to test something, I can just throw that little picture in Photoshop and do a mock-up. So I will do that. When I get up from here, I'll take a photo and either tonight or tomorrow, I'll sort of mock up the change that I want to do to the headdress so that I don't, because if I want this, if I don't want to pull this big weight, if I don't want to pull this big weight over here, it would be a shame to dirty up all this pristine white space by sort of sketching it in and then erasing it. That would be a bummer. So I'd rather just mock it in in Photoshop and see what I think. And then that way I can have my nice white surface there. Gob Nick says, Steven, I can't be in the flow without you. How am I going to fix that? LOL. Set up a recurring charge on your bank account where you send me $20 every minute for the rest of your life. And every time that you send me that $20, that's going to be like, you're, you're connected with me. You know, we're in relationship when you do that. And you'll know that every minute I'm going to get that notification. Like you just got $20 from Gopnik and I'm going to be like, I'm going to be sending the waves, you know, like the alpha beta waves, the theta waves, dude. I'm going to be... They're going to go out into the universe, into the ether. It's going to be like some quantum entanglement, like strange, spooky distance at an action kind of a stuff, you know, all for the low, low price of $20 a minute, every minute for the rest of your life. Easy, easy. Goodbye, John. Enjoy your class with Peter Hahn. Made my day to see you were streaming tonight, Stephen. Great to see you back. Thank you, Yankee. Happy to make days. Happy to make days. I am probably going to get off of here soon, though. It is getting late here, and I got to wind down before Betty Bye. Whoa. And there's my wife right on cue. That must mean she's about to make my dog bark. All right, everybody. I'm just going to close this off because uh, I don't want your ears to get blown off, and I was going to go soon anyway. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for being here. Sorry to run. But I'm going to cut out. Hey, how you doing? Hey. What's up? Are you nearby? Uh, no, I just got off the train. That's pretty nearby. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, oh, that's nice. Well, I'm going to see you soon anyway. All right. Well, I'm actually, I'm on stream right now. That's the, yeah, that's the thing. Talking to you on stream. Um, but I was about to get off. Um, let me say goodbye to everybody and I'll call you back. All right. Okay. Make sure you get some wire up. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Yeah, I got to go. Peace, everybody. Take care. Goodbye, Haru. Goodbye, John Vincent. Goodbye, Thunderwolf 4. Goodbye, Andro Taz. Goodbye, Kaizo. That's $28,800 a day. Nice. That sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty good. I mean, you know, it's a little low for someone like me, but I don't have to do much. So not that bad. Not that bad. Goodbye, Carmen's Journey. Goodbye, Yankee. Goodbye, who'd I miss? Gotnik, Finlay, Patrick, Dufil, Kaizo, Seth Hat. Goodbye, everybody. Peace. I will see you soon.